I think Blender is such a great tool and it can produce such amazing stuff as well. I'd, I'd love to see more people um, doing stuff in Blender and, and doing stuff with data and data animation as well. And, and if, if you can sort of chin the render times with it, it's um, it's definitely worth trying. Um, I love Cinema 4D and DEM Earth as well. It's, it's a great plugin for that. Um, obviously, there's a, there's a price barrier with that though. Welcome to another episode of the Mapscaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and this is a podcast for the geospatial community. Today I'm talking to Craig Taylor from a company called Ito World and he's going to be telling us about his inspirational work with geo-visualization and animation. Welcome Craig, thank you so much for coming along today and taking the time to do this interview with me. You're doing a lot of really interesting things, really interesting things. And I think one of the first things that caught my eye about your work is a project you did called Coral Cities. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about that. But I think before we really dive into that conversation, maybe it'd be a good idea if we take the listeners with us and you could tell me a little bit about your, your background in terms of geospatial. Yeah, sure. I mean, thank you for having me, first and foremost. Um, this is the first podcast I've ever recorded, so it is both equally terrifying and exciting at the same time so uh yeah um i'm a newbie to this right okay well um yeah a bit of background on me so well i currently work for a company called ito world um and i'm heading up their data visualization service team at the moment i'll talk a little bit about what we do more specifically later but in terms of my training and, and where i started i suppose like many gis practitioners um in the uk um i started with an undergrad in geography and um, I was introduced to GIS um, and remote sensing um, and it sort of immediately clicked with me. I like the technical aspect and um, more importantly, I like the design aspect. I loved creating maps and I found it really interesting. And that kind of progressed on Lancaster University where I studied was quite progressive in its uptake of GIS and technologies. And they started a uh, master's program um, called environmental informatics, which basically and took GIS and remote sensing and used used it in a way that was applied to real world scenarios. So, for instance, um, where would you put a waste treatment facility in the UK? And then it would we would be using GIS as a sort of proxy to to do that um, using you know site sieve analysis and multi criteria analysis. So that was really interesting. I thought that was great, and um, that sort of cemented the idea that this is this is my sort of career track. And for the first I suppose ten years of my career, it was pretty much working my way through various planning and engineering companies as a GIS analyst and cartographer. So like some Michel, Barton Wilmore, uh, Bjorn Happold. And it was sort of, it was a real mixture of GIS work. It was, it was kind of uh, heavy plan production stuff, which, you know, you, you kind of come to expect um, with a bit of light analysis. And it sort of wasn't really until um, I worked at a company called Barton Wilmore that um, really started using GIS a little bit more to its max taking me back to the university days we we worked on behalf of a lot of house builders um and they wanted to look for sites in the uk to develop a housing block um or housing you know housing development site um, and we'd use multi-criteria analysis to figure out where to put that so we would take in loads of different environmental constraint factors planning factors um, and we would sort of overlay them all on top of each other and use different weightings and criteria analysis to figure out where best to put something so that was great it was using sort of GIS to to where I wanted to use to, to how I wanted to use it and then I kind of segued a little bit into uh, we, we we used to sort of produce lightweight web maps using Mapbox GL and um, for these clients they could sort of interactively explore all the data which was which was great and I kind of around this time I, I I sort of wanted to transition a little bit more into the design side of things I always loved 3D I always loved the design side of GIS and the cartography and and you know, back in the days when you kind of using Arc Scene, um, which was great for what it was, but I always found like it was a massive constraint in terms of the aesthetic quality that I was producing. So um, I remember seeing uh, this guy. His name's I think it's uh, Louis Dilger. Uh, his work on Behance on city layouts, um, and he was using Cinema 4D and rendering these absolutely incredible cinema uh, city layouts in um, it was either Arnold or Octane. And that then became my goal. I, I wanted to produce something that was as good as that that like that was the best thing i'd seen in terms of 3d geospatial and i was like right that's that's my pinnacle when i get there started learning um a lot of blender so blender is a really great open source 3d package and you know using their <coughs> cycles renderer to sort of achieve that real world lighting that louis had in his 
um, city layouts was, and I was nearly getting there. And, and, and Blender has some really good GIS interpolation tools, so you could bring in, you know, built form uh, road networks and start extruding them, um, sort of creating these flat city layouts. Um, but then I sort of oh, got, 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 got hooked up on not being able to use topography. So I could never really drape these buildings on top of topography. So like, for instance, if you're doing a map of San Francisco, you'd want that undulating topography. And I could never get that until I sort of went into the Cinema 4D world. Um, and there's an there's a amazing plugin from a guy called Paul Everett uh, called DM Earth, which basically allowed you to do that. So that then became my tool of, my GIS tool of choice for producing these sort of 3D layouts and, and and then that sort of natural progression into animation. I was sort of got bored of just doing static plans of just, you know, this is the environment, this is the terrain. I wanted to bring data in and, you know, whether that data was just house price data for the UK's extruded polygons or visualizing vehicle flow along a sort of route network. Um, that then became my my goal. And and around this time I saw uh, it's actually kind of weird. Before I even knew about Eto World, they they won a competition with the AGI um, to create this visualization of people flow in London over New Year's Eve, and they used uh, telef- um, telephony data to do that. And it it was just amazing. It was this beautiful organic visualization of people movement as these you know uh, little hexagons that were sort of extruding and and migrating over time. And it was just I just thought, wow, that is the most eff- like effective data visualization for geospatial data that i've ever seen and i it was one of them things where you just watch it on loop and it was like this is brilliant and then that became my goal so you know trying to hack cinema 4d to to do these kind of uh visualizations was really difficult because it's great with geometry but it doesn't well, i always found it wasn't really great for linking raw data to it so you know trying and trying and trying with these different things on my twitter feed was full of these really crappy um sort of very very generic animations and you know one thing led to another i got talking to eto world and and that's where i am today sort of heading up their data visualization services using their software um to create you know all these weird, weird and wonderful geospatial visualizations and that's kind of it in a nutshell really <laughs> sorry i went on a little bit then but it's not a problem at all. It was interesting. Hey, um, you did say a lot there, though, and it, that's fair enough because it's been a, it's been a long journey for you. But what I got out of it was that you started off as this sort of classically trained geographer, if you will, doing GIS, and you moved into planning. And but you could see the light. You could see something else over there that you aspired to be. At, at, at you really wanted to be able to do an experiment with, and you did it. That in itself, I think, is really inspirational. And, but I think it highlights this idea that um, the, the GIS guy or girl sitting out in a, an, an organization is doing a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and they, they seem to be expected to be specialists in so many different fields where you were really interested in the visualization side of things. And you took it a step further because you took that visualization out of GIS or at least those um, the classic pieces of software that I think most people listening to this podcast are, are used to using or hearing about anyway and you took it over to something completely different that was specially designed for those kinds of visualizations so i think that's a really interesting progression and i think we're probably going to see that role of the the gis guy or girl out at the organization being split up more and more and more and not being expected to be able to do everything with the server and the database and the web map and create visualizations as well as run analysis well yeah i think you know i think it's important to for people to feel like they shouldn't be constrained by a piece of software and that, you know, you shouldn't necessarily need to use open source. You shouldn't need to use a certain proprietary software. You should just do something that you you feel is comfortable for you and can do what you want to do. So I found that the softwares I were using weren't producing stuff that looked like I wanted to. So I found a piece of software that did and and just learned that. And I think that's really important to to not to not feel that you should ever be capped by by software that's just ridiculous you should always kind of aspire to you know to do something more than that yeah and, and i think what you're talking about there is choosing the best tool for the job to complete the goal and some things that i find my, or a thing that i find myself repeating on this podcast is that i personally was in the situation where i had fallen in in love with the medium as opposed to the mission you know if the mission was to create the best geo visualizations possible do what you did find the right tool for the job and go over there 
instead of being religious about I am open source, I am Esri, I am whatever else, I only program in Python or R. So I really, really like that approach. And I hope that that inspires other people when they listen to this to go and find the best tool that allows them to do the best work possible. Yeah, and it's and it's also you know you'll never you'll never find one piece of software that does everything you need to do. Like for instance, I loved Cinema and I loved doing stuff in there, but it was rubbish at database management and and there was no audit trail to my data sets. You know, basically everything. And still now we we have sort of um, we have bespoke software in Eto World that that does a certain amount of stuff. But so, you know you still need the GIS softwares to underpin a lot of the spatial analysis we do. So it's I think it's important to, you know, be able to use as many different software, not be able to use as many different softwares as possible, because you you almost get put in that thing of, well, I can use loads of different softwares, but I'm not a master of any. I just think it's important to, you know, be able to use the softwares that you need to do a specific job. Yeah, yeah, it it does. At the very start of this interview, I I talked about something called Coral Cities. Um, can, can you explain a little bit about what, what you've done there? Part of my role at Eto World, well, my role at Eto World is to produce visualizations for our clients, um, quite high-end cinematic visualizations, depicting data in new and interesting ways. Th- that's the sort of service sector that that I run, and we produce all sorts of different visualizations for clients. You know, like High Blue um, Telematics companies, and you know, likes of TomTom and DFT. There's another sort of aspect of my role, which is to to kind of find new and interesting ways to visualize data as well and and produce concept pieces that kind of take what could be considered quite a generic uh, sort of data set and and turn it into something that looks a little bit more interesting. And and that's kind of where Coral Cities came alive a little bit. So we we were working on a project for the Department for Transport where we were looking for innovative ways to show drive time catchments. Now, um, a lot of the work I do is in, the 3D realm. Um, so, you know, we're always looking to try and pop data out of the screen along a, a sort of Z axis. Um, and we were looking at these drive time catchments and they were, you know, the your generic um, polygon areas and they were quite flat on the screen. And we just thought, ah, it's not, it's not really, it's not really dynamic. It's not popping out. You know, it doesn't look incredible in 3D. It's probably if we're going to just do that, there's no point using 3D. So, what we started to do was um, expose that underlying um, route road network. So we would figure out the road network that was within a certain catchment area, and then we would start doing stuff to extrude these um, road networks. So we'd create like these mini fences, which kind of had this 3D vibe to it, but still was quite flat. And then I had an idea, idea to <laughs> basically, for each vertice on that road network, to extrude it proportional to the height from the center of the city. So for instance, the closer you'd be to the center of the city, the higher up that point would be. And, and that sort of created these really weird um, drive time mountains is what we called them. Um, and then we were sort of playing around internally and, and um, my CTO, Hal Bertram, um, was sort of like, oh, yeah, but what happens if we invert these? Um, and we inverted it and we created this um, coral type formation. And we were like, oh, wow, this is amazing. And then and then that kind of project uh took a life of its own really we we did a uh, sort of a quick concept piece for uh, the uh, eu uh, cities release uh, livability index and we visualized the top 10 livable cities um as coral cities and that got a little bit of traction on social media and we thought well okay this is a really cool cool project and i just kind of took it from there really and and we produced um oh, over a hundred of these coral cities um through the space of kind of six months and um, we packaged them up as posters and these little animations and we um submitted to submitted them to um the information is beautiful awards um and yeah it was just a, it was a it was a great project to sort of um visualize like i said quite a generic data set but just turn it into something that was far more engaging and, and far more beautiful um than 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 what 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 it, what it was in its current form and i think you raise a really interesting point there and like data can just be beautiful it can just be amazing and that has some value in itself i think you know we're not always trying to trying to visualize a a whole screed of numbers or you know try and put a whole bunch of text in there sometimes it's enough just to make people stop 
you know, give us, give, give us your attention just for two seconds. Look at this. And maybe that'll lead on to something else if they're really interested in, in how it was made or, or what the, the story is you're trying to tell there. But I, I really like that, that sometimes it's just enough to make something that's, that's beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a really fine line between – so the concept pieces um, – are great you know they can uh, i'm not really bothered if they're too insightful or not they're just fun little visualization things but for our clients for instance there always has to be insight so it has to you know we we sort of pride ourselves on each visualization has um engagement it has insight and it and it and it must have a narrative to it as well so we can create stuff that looks really nice and get get people engaged that's great but we also think of ourselves fundamentally as interpreters of data um so we like to you know create animations that grab an audience's attention but we also understand the importance of insight so with our software we ingest huge volumes of data um, we can drive insight over a temporal scale and also we like to think of ourselves as storytellers right so every visualization we produce is kind of like a user-guided experience for a data set they may or may not be familiar with by hope by the hope at the end of that visualization they understand the sort of the narrative and the insight that we're telling them so creating stuff that's beautiful is is important because that gets initial engagement but it has to have a story it has to be insightful and i hold my hands up and and the, some of the visualizations that i produce have been you know i think they look quite good but i don't have much insight at all and and quite recently um i sort of felt the um felt the brunt of that with um i found an amazing data, data set um for uh, basketball shot trajectories well it wasn't shot trajectories it was just the nca released this huge data set back to 2013 that showed where every single point was scored um or scored or missed from from a basketball shot um and i i had this idea uh, to create a kind of buzzer beater visualization so visualizing all the shots that were made and not made um in the last sort of seconds of the game and um i kind of thought it looked cool it was it was this sort of arc based trajectory thing with all these spheres going into the hoops and it was kind of you know it's a super busy really quick visualization it was only like 10 seconds long and, and I sort of thought uh, I had some you know I put a previous one on reddit and it, and it got a few upvotes so I was like oh, okay I'll put this one on reddit and it quickly dawned on me that people you know they don't just like stuff that's beautiful there needs to be insight and there's so many comments about yeah but you know this looks great but what's it showing it's, it's too it's too busy you know there's there's you shouldn't be showing two sides of the court and all these comments which was valid feedback but you know it's 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 difficult to get that sort of fine line right and you just wanted to respond saying you know this is just a bit of fun but um yeah obviously it's difficult to find that balance that's what i'm trying to get at just like before we were talking about find the right tool for the job and there's different tools for different jobs there's different visualizations for for different kinds of impacts that you're trying to have if you're trying to tell a story perhaps it's a good idea to have some more context around that uh, if we could stay with that example for a little bit how would you put context around that would you do the like the seven classic things that we were that we were taught to do with a map back in the day at university, would you put the title and the the key and the and the whatever else on it, or what other kinds of things could you do to to put that context into the visualization itself without having to link someone off uh, somewhere else to to read about it? Yeah, so it's I mean, three D animation is is in my opinion, you know, it's quite a bit different from. Um, your, your sort of generic cartography and map production. Um, and there was, a, there was a really lovely tweet from um, a super, song, super talented cartographer, Sarah Bell, who kind of, you know, tweeted about, you know, improvising from the riffs and, and, and not being constrained by the fundamentals of cartography and, ex, you know, um, experimenting and, and sort of evolving. And, and that sort of chimed so true for me. I mean, my ethos in design is is to always constantly try and create something different, to try and evolve your visualization style, and and not be you know the fundamentals of cartography are are really important and they've helped they underpin a lot of our visualizations. But I don't think you should be constrained by them, and they shouldn't be they shouldn't be this chain that holds you back. And and sort of going on to you know having legends and having titles and and all the sort of the standard kind generic cartography stuff. It, sometimes it just doesn't apply for um you know animation and animation it, it kind of is like a visual tour and um, we're, we're producing a visualization at the moment for um tom tom and um one of the things was well do we put a legend on or do we just have 
you know, a quick explanation of what the data is at the beginning. And then once a user reads that, then they can then understand what's happening. And the sort of the, the, the standard cartography um, principles just sometimes are not needed in 3D animation. And, and I think, you know, I, I think that's important. And I think you, you kind of need to, you know, as I say, an experiment. And sometimes through them experiments, you'll fail. Um, but it's only when you fail that you realize, okay, well, maybe we did need a legend that's stuck through your whole thing, or maybe we did need an explanation text, or maybe we did need this, that, and the other. Or there was some more context that was needed because this data on its own didn't make sense unless it was put in, you know, context of other data sets as well. Um, so it's, yeah, it completely varies from project to project. But I guess that doesn't really surprise me that you fail sometimes and you get feedback and you do it again. And that's, you know, in the soft, in the software, software world, if you were building something, it'd be pretty normal to come out with, with a prototype, have it fail, get some feedback, you know, make some changes, go out again, fail again, get more feedback and that sort of iterative process of improving things before it gets to the end user. And it feels like that's what you're talking about here in terms of visualization. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, um... All of our projects we produce for our clients, we go through you know, multiple stages of iteration. We'll sort of storyboard. Um, a, a lot of the clients that we work with have never worked with animation before, so they don't really know how to put into words what they want to show, and they don't really know what their narrative is. So we try and storyboard frame by frame, or you know, as, as frame by frame as you can get each stage of that visualization. But there'll be points in that iteration process where the client will go, okay, well, now I see it visualized and now I see my data visualized. It doesn't really work like that. Or now I see my data visualized. It's actually telling me a different pattern because we've never seen it visualized that, that before. And, and so you have these sort of quite important or very important feedback loops with clients where you kind of iterate and, and, and change things on the fly. And, um, and it's really important to not get held down by a visualization style. And, I, and on our recent project, I had this amazing idea that I was going to show this um, visualization style of vehicle flow, but I kind of wanted to show these hourly blocks and it was it was sort of like this quite conceptual point cloud and, and I showed it to the client and they were they were like, oh, this looks amazing, but it's too complicated for our audience. And and again, like it was, it, you know, spent a fair bit of work producing this, but it was that failure that made me realize, oh, okay, right, let's go back to the drawing board. Let's, let's, let's you know, make it more clearer, more, you know, not as conceptual visualization and, and that worked. The, the client loved it and it was, you know, successful. But even when you're on, you know, it's not just the small concept pieces where you'll throw out on Twitter and, and someone will go, ah, that's rubbish. It's the the big projects that we have with our clients where we go through these several stages of iteration where you just sometimes you just don't hit it right first time and, and you just kind of have to be able to, as a designer, have to be able to take criticism and take that feedback and, and sort of adapt and evolve through it and, and so failure is very very important for what we do because it makes us better designers and makes us better analysts and and yeah it's it's vital in our sort of design process you mentioned the word designer there quite a few quite a number of times do you see yourself as a cartographer or a graphic designer or an animator i mean you're still working with, with geographic data well how do you how do you see yourself <laughs> <laughs> don't really know um well you know like i said gis and, and spatial analytics underpins all of our visualizations so that training of being able to analyze data sets spatially is, is vital but i also have this passion as a designer and with design comes animation and that's another thing in itself of you know another sector which i i'm, I'm sort of fairly new to and that's a big learning curve but I love the design side of stuff. I love making stuff look interesting and beautiful. And, um, uh, you know, I suppose I would never class myself as a designer, but I'm sort of more as a spatial designer than anything else, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, and again, I, I wasn't trying to trap you there or trick you into to hopping into one box or another. <laughs> yeah. I, I just think it's interesting. I think yeah. that... Yeah, Get off the but, but I think that's really interesting because oftentimes I'll say I'm a GIS consultant, but I also work with databases and I do this and I do this and I make maps sometimes. And I also look at web maps, web maps and debug them and fix the problems that are between them and the database and all these other things. But that all comes under the heading of, of GIS. And like what I said earlier, in my mind, at least that's been broken up or at least there's becoming more and more room in the industry. If you want to go more down the design route, then people recognize that uh, that, that gives value now and if you're good at that then we're prepared to pay yeah. for that 
And, and I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm. Um, which, which brings me on to my next question now. Um, so, so you've had the, this great journey. You've started from that, that sort of classic uh, tr training in university with GIS and you, you've moved through the planning stage of your career. And now you're into this really sort of experimental design stage where you, you're playing with a lot of different visualizations and working with companies and trying to do things in a new way. When you look out at the market now, when you look out at the industry, maybe not as a whole, but your piece of it in terms of geodata visualization, what are the really big opportunities out there at the moment? I think it's just, I think the landscape of GIS has just changed quite a bit over the years. It's, you know, as a GIS analyst or, you know, consultant now, you're not just required to make plans. You need to be able to, you know, produce a web map. You need to be able to, you know, analyze X, Y, and Z. And it's, it's, it's a broader spectrum, you know, the, and technology as well is, is, is sort of becoming far more accessible. So um, like I was saying, when I was sort of learning animation, um, I had sort of Blender and Cinema 4D to, to sort of use. I don't think even QGIS at the time didn't have the time manager, or maybe it did have the time manager plugin, but it was kind of quite rudimentary. But now you've got some, you know, amazing libraries like, uh, like Kepler, for instance, um, that you can do, you know, amazing visualizations in 3D with that's that's more accessible than it was, you know, five years ago. And I think the accessibility to these tools and to the the general sort of landscape as a whole is becoming far more accessible and it's it's becoming broader as well. And more people are doing more stuff in animation and more people are doing more stuff in 3D and more people are able to use um you know Blender and 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 this, that, and the other to create these incredible pieces. And it's almost like the bar is being raised and raised and raised, but more people are, you know, being able to access it easier as well. So I think it's a really exciting time for spatial at the moment because there's so it's so it's so varied. You know, you can be a developer, you can be a website, um, you know, you can work with Mapbox GL or whatever you want to work with, you can make web maps, you can be a designer, you can work in 3D and, and have that spatial um thing as well and it's just there's so it's so much broader than it was you know 10 years ago when i first started in gis and you were only required to produce well constraint plans or whatever you did you know in as a, as a sort of consultant's role so uh, after that it feels like you have that abundance mentality that there's room for everyone there's plenty of opportunity and you don't see this a, as a threat as taking away that sort of gatekeeper status that that some of us in the industry have had before so you see it as inspirational and you know at the opportunities abound yeah absolutely i mean you know for for our clients as well it and it's 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 quite difficult sometimes when you go into a sort of a client meeting and you're presenting geospatial animation for the first time and they just haven't got a clue because they've never seen geospatial animation before but now it's becoming more and more popular and now clients are seeing more of it it's becoming more accessible so Whereas in the past, they didn't know they needed something because they didn't know they could have something. Now it's like, ah, oh, you know, we can see that being produced there, there and there. We want that as well. So it's almost, you know, like there's more opportunity now than there ever was because people are more familiar with animation and, and, sort, of ge and, and sort of spatial storytelling than they were before. So it sounds like this is a, a positive feedback loop that we're in. The more there is, the more de the more demand it creates because people see this and go, wow, that's amazing. I, so. I would like to be able to visualize our data like that. I want to tell stories in this way as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to think so. <laughs> um, so I've just got a couple more questions now bef before we say goodbye. I, I realize that we're they're running out of, well, running short on time anyway. And, and one of them is when you look out at the market now, Again, I say market. What I mean to say is industry in terms of geo, um, geo visualization and animations. Can you see any trends at the moment? These things tend to move in trends. We 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 see someone doing something amazing and we add a little bit to it. But that sort of general trend is, is there. Is there anything that you can see at the moment that seems to be predominant in animation, in spatial animation? Not in terms of predominant, because I still think it's fairly new as a field. Um, you know, that, that people are still sort of trying to find new data sets and visualize it. I mean, transport, <laughs> ETO World, I, I work for ETO World who specialize in transit data. So we visualize movement data and that's kind of a shoe in for animation. And there are lots of people visualizing, um, you know, like GTFS feeds or real time bus feeds or train feeds or car or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I, I see a lot of that on my, you know, inspiration feeds, um, which is great. Um, but also, I, I kind of, 
I don't like to follow the trend of, okay, everybody's visualizing X or everyone's visualizing Y. I like to find new things and visualize them in different ways as well. And I think it's important to be creative and not just have a look at what someone else has produced and then try and produce it exactly the same, you know, iterate on that, you know, develop it a little bit more. And I think, I think that's, that process creates the more interesting visualization pieces as well. So we, we talked a little bit about the tools that you use, and I don't claim to be, to know all of them, but is there any set of tools or one or two out there that you're most excited about when you think about the, the future of this? Okay, definitely. Can I not say on the fence and say all of them on this one? Do I have to go down? Um, so I think for me, uh, I mean, obviously we have our own internal tools that allow us to do um, our own set of visualizations and you know, uh, like I mentioned him before, our CTO, Hal, he's so talented in this and he's constantly creating, uh, you know, shaders and all sorts of different ways for me to create new visualizations. Um, but sort of parking that in terms of the, um, the accessibility for other people as well. And I think, you know, QGIS is, is, is doing some really amazing stuff with where it's being developed in terms of the um, animation stuff and its 3D capabilities as well. Obviously, Kepler is just an amazing tool set for visualizing spatial data and that's become more and more accessible there's a load of other online tools which you know i don't claim to to know or or um or you know know much about but as well as you know the blender the the world of blenders i i think blender is such a great tool and it can produce such amazing stuff as well i'd, I'd love to see more people um doing stuff in blender and, and doing stuff with data and data animation as well and, and if, if you can sort of chin the render times with it it's um it's definitely worth trying um i love cinema 4d and dm earth as well it's, it's a great plugin for that um obviously there's a, there's a price barrier with that though yeah and you know it, it's it's not just that it's you know things like tableau as well there's, there's people doing stuff with Tableau, for instance, that are just absolutely amazing. And Tableau's got Mapbox integration now, and it just looks, some of the visualizations that are being produced um, look incredible. And it's such, it's so great to see, you know, different practitioners from different parts of the visualization world doing different things with data. But but it's, you know, it's almost like, oh, I want to learn Tableau now because I want to be able to do all these dashboard stuff. But it's, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's great. It's a, it's a great place to be in at the moment. I have a feeling that I already know the answer to this, but but I'd like to answer uh, ask it anyway as, as like the final question in this interview. And that is, well, where do you think this is going in the future in terms of geo visualization? Are we just going to see more of it or do you see it going in any one particular direction? It's, it's difficult. So obviously from a, animation point of view i'd love to see more um more accessibility to animation tools in softwares um but more you know it so animation is difficult in that it's not just the data that needs to be animated you need camera movements and all sorts of stuff and i'd love to see more softwares you know using that camera movement um type thing and, and there's i think google studio is it called i think that's which has been released recently is is kind of bridging the gap between spatial and almost like the after effects world as well and that, that's really interesting um and i think in general we're just going to see more and more of this this being accessible you know i think i'd love to think people see the value in spatial storytelling through animation um, and i'm going to be really positive in, in that this this i do see this sector is growing and growing and becoming more and more important um, and I think, you know, more and more companies like the Esri's and QGIS's of this world are, are going to end up incorporating more and more tools that allow you to be able to analyze, you know, spatial data sets that have a temporal um, element to them as well. Yeah, I was actually really pleased that you mentioned QGIS before in terms of one of your tools that you're excited about, because I feel like that's really accessible for people. They're probably already using it in, anyway, if they're working in the, in the GIS field or have at least heard of it and it's, it just seems like so much more accessible and instead of going out and downloading blender and starting right from scratch again yeah i mean there's yeah <laughs> obviously if you're if you're sort of new to spatial um and new to 3d don't go straight in with blender because it is incredibly confusing but yeah understand the principles and the core you know understand the core principles of cartography and being able to produce um you know maps in in sort of industry sound of software is, is great but then you know once you feel comfortable in that i definitely encourage everyone to just explore other softwares and and you know stick some data in blender and see what happens um 
and make mistakes really because that you end up becoming a better designer a better analyst when you realize what the you know drawbacks of of certain visualizations are craig i really want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me today i I said this at the start, at least I believe I did. I, f I think your story is really inspirational. The work you do is is beautiful it's, and also inspirational. And I would encourage the listeners to to go out and Google Coral Cities and have a look at that because it, it's a really interesting piece of work. Thanks again for coming along today. But before you, you leave us, can you tell us where we can go to learn more about you and follow along? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So um, I definitely encourage um you all to check out ito world because um that's my company or the company i work for and we're doing some amazing stuff in visualization um i'm on twitter at craig taylor gis and i'm always um putting different visualization pieces and concept pieces and fun and stupid visualizations on there um, i also have a website which i haven't updated in a while but i should do and that's mapzilla-art.co.uk um and yeah um like I said, I'm always producing that. Uh, do you know what? For me, um, especially social media and having interaction with other people and other people in the industry and producing this sort of stuff is 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 really great. But it's it's the feedback that you get and it's, you know, it doesn't need to be positive. It can be, you know, critical as well. And that's really important as well. And and I would encourage everyone to, you know, if you are producing, you know, visualizations and um, to, to share them with other people and, and you know the cartography and data visualization world is a really welcoming uh, you know sector um, especially on twitter um, and you know i'd encourage everyone to share their work um, ask for critique there's some um, there's some great slack options as well so if, you, if you're familiar with slack and um, the data visualization society has a great slack um, and you know people put stuff all the time on there. Like they, there's so many different channels for so many different needs. There's a mapping channel um, that people put stuff on and ask for feedback all the time. But I think, you know, for me as well, like sharing is is a really important part of of what I do and, and, and getting feedback and, and sort of evolving. And I think being able to interact with with people on Twitter is really important. So I'd encourage everyone to to share more. <laughs> thanks again, Craig. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Thanks very much for having me. And that's it for another episode of the Map Escaping Podcast. My name is Daniel and I'd just like to ask you for one small favor today and that would be if you are enjoying these podcast episodes, please share it with a friend. I would really appreciate it. I'd also like to remind you that you are more than welcome to reach out to me on social media. I would love to hear from you and you'll find some useful links in the show notes. That's it from me. We'll talk again next week. Bye.